What's up, guys? And we're back for another episode of The Justin Caviar Show. My guest today is Tanner Chidester, founder of Elite CEOs, an eight-figure consulting company, and the author of the book Infinite Income. All right, Tanner is the winner of 10X Award from ClickFunnels, which represents eight figures and a funnel and the author of his book. And if anyone knows anything about ClickFunnels, that's a really, really big accomplishment. Tanner, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Justin. Excited to be here. Awesome, man. So let's just jump right into it. Uh, tell people a little bit more about what you do. Yeah, so uh, originally I started off, I was a trainer and I was not doing very well. And so I started an online uh, fitness company, just getting people in shape, you know, lifting weights, all that kind of stuff. And I had a lot of success early on. I, I got it to a uh, seven figures in the first year. And from there, I just started having a bunch of trainers ask me for help. Um, you know, trainers usually don't make that much. Uh, and at first I, I was like, please, like, I don't want to help you. Cause I actually had a really bad stigma with uh, business consultants and coaches, mm -hmm. but it just got to the point where I had so many people asking uh, because I had proof that I was like, uh, okay, like it's another seven figure business. I'll do it. Uh, not like it was a burden, but it, it made sense. So I did that and that business actually exploded. Uh, got that to seven figures in about three months. And then from there, just more of the same people from other industries start asking me for help. And so it just naturally kind of transitioned all the way over to where now, like my main focus is the business consulting side. And, um, that's kind of, that's what I do. And that's how it transitioned. So I, I always thought I was gonna be the fitness guy, but it's just kind of funny how life works. That's crazy because if you, if you know someone that's in the click funnel community like Russell Brunson or something they have an understanding because they see a lot of people you know because they're getting all the data they're they're behind the curtain right but for someone that doesn't know anything about online marketing maybe has like a real career like an engineer or something to make seven figures at that speed that's like warp speed time yeah for them it's kind of unbelievable it's like they don't believe it how, how does that even how do you break that down did you kind of just fall into something or did you figure out like a secret you know traffic secrets or something Right. Well, so the, I mean, the first part is understand I didn't have a life. So, you know, okay. people are like, how'd you do that? Well, I was able to go much faster because I was working all day. So, I mean, I was generating leads, getting on the sales calls, doing the fulfillment. I mean, I would just work and work and work. So the business would grow super fast so I could hire it out. That was really my big goal. But uh, really the irony is that uh, two years before that I was struggling, but during those two years, I had three key things that happened. So the first thing was I got mentorship from a guy named David Fry, who's actually uh, married to one of Russell Brunson's cousins. So he, I get in his office and he's like, look, this is for free. I'm not going to pay you, but I'll teach you. So I started learning about funnels and opt-in pages, all that kind of stuff that is boring to most people. And I wasn't making any money, but it was kind of setting me up for the future. And then during those uh, two, the jobs I did during that time was door-to-door -door sales. And then I did, I was a server. So when I finally transitioned, I was trying to basically sell a $47 product uh, in fitness, but I didn't realize, you know, I didn't have a back end. I didn't really know how to run ads. I didn't have money to run ads. So I'm literally messaging people to buy a $50 product. You can imagine that didn't work well. So I got on a call and they just basically said, hey, like sell your stuff high ticket. I didn't know what high ticket was. I, I was the person who was like, there's no way people buy this, right? And so I just started calling people and DMing them off my Instagram. And I think in that first week I made 10 grand and I was, I was relieved, but I was also livid because I felt like I was this close for two years and I was not living very well. Like, uh, you know, very bad car, very bad living situation. Wasn't very you know proud of where I was at. So uh, that's how it honestly happened. But it was, yeah. it was kind of, it kind of fell in my lap in the sense I went through some experiences that helped me, but on the other hand, why I went so fast, I just tell people, you know, it wasn't necessarily healthy. I'll just say that. But I was so determined to hit my goal that I, I didn't I literally didn't care about anything else uh, to a detriment in some aspects because it put a straight on some relationships and I didn't date any girls. And, you know, uh, <laughs> like when, when you're only working, I, I think life doesn't become as enjoyable because you're just so focused, I guess. But. Yeah, you have the tunnel vision, and it's kind of like an elite athletes. Like, if you're an elite swimmer and you're in the Olympics, like Michael Phelps, you're not thinking about anything else but swimming. That's it. And it's kind of how you were with funnels and building the online space. But let's be honest, right? There's a lot of people that work, quote unquote, hard. Like, Tanner, what do you mean? I've been working hard for 10 years, and I'm still. 
you know, I'm still struggling. I feel like a lot of people, they say they work hard, right? But there's obvious differences in like what the outcome is, right? Like working hard and working smart and having the tactics. Would you say that having that mentorship was the biggest differentiating factor? Because there's a lot of people that work hard. Yeah, I think, I think, well, I think one in terms of working hard, some people, they think they're working hard, like they actually do, but they don't realize how much harder they can work. So it's almost like sports. Sports was such a good uh, lesson for me because I got to play all the, out all the way to the D1 uh, level. And I mean, there were workouts. I pushed myself so hard, I would almost throw up and I was in great shape. You know, but we, we had what workout it was two and a half hours of lifting. And then we ran 16, one hundreds and you had to hit it under 14 seconds or you had to redo it. Yeah, so, I mean, that's a four, three, four hour workout. Um, and the coaches are watching. So you're pushing yourself. You're not doing some like half ass thing. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, I agree. Yeah. The, the mentorship of paying coaches, you know, I, I've spent to date, I've done the math. I've done about a million dollars to date, uh, different programs of coaches. And a lot of people, you know, they're like, well, a lot of coaches suck. And I actually agree with that. I think probably 80% do. Um, and I, I think you can see that in any industry that's not regulated. I mean, just it's anyone can do it. So therefore, there's there's going to be really good people, but there's always going to be a lot of bad people. Um, but what it did is it, it taught me how to move what worked and didn't very quickly. Because what most of us struggle with is, well, is this the right way or am I doing it wrong? Right, because there's a, that's what always confused me is I'm like, I'm doing this really hard, but is it the right way or not? So when you get a coach or a program, whatever, they're gonna give you a very direct path. So then all you have to do is follow it and then you're gonna kind of know for sure. And because there's that trust built in, it's easier to just do it. So yeah, for me, yeah, I would agree. I think not only the unpaid mentorship, but the paid mentorship, um, you add that with hard work and a little bit of logic, right? Okay, I keep hitting my head on this door, probably should change direction. And that's, that's really kind of what the breakthrough was for me because I kept doing what they said. And then when it didn't work, I tried something else and it did. I was like, okay, well, cool. I'm just going to do this because this works. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How important do you think like reaching out and paying people, right? It's like not playing the guessing game anymore, right? It's like before you're, you're always guessing, does this work? Does that work? Yeah. Versus if you pay someone like you or you pay someone like, a, you know, whoever, a Grant Cardone, a Ty Lopez, a Gary Vee, They've already done all the work. They already know what works. They already know what doesn't work. They charge high because, you know, they're valued high. What would you say to someone that maybe they've never bought any high ticket stuff? Maybe they're scared. Maybe they don't have a lot of money in their, you know, they're counting. Oh, I got to pay this. I got to pay that. And all these things are piling up and they're trying to build a business, but they know they need help, but they're just scared to pull the trigger. What would you tell that person? Yeah. So, I mean, from personal experience, that's what held me back. So 23 to 25, I just was like, I was a, I'm a former engineer and division one athlete. So I'm just egotistical where, Oh, I don't need anyone's help. Like I'll figure this out. Mm. So I think what it was is what happens with people in success is you can't go forever without a win or you'll quit. I mean, that's just human nature because what happens is like you're putting all your effort into this and you're seeing no results. And then people are in your ear. Like, dude, like you might as well just come out. Like you're not going anywhere anyways. Like you keep wasting your time. So it starts to wear you down. You get very discouraged. So, um, I think my advice would be is that it can, you can't really be any worse off. And and the way it, it, that finally registered in my head is at 23, I had about $2,000 in my bank account. And at 25 doing things my way, I had $25,000 in my bank account. And so I was like, you know what? I'm at the point where I'm so, I want to be successful so bad that I'll literally, I'm willing to be homeless to get help from someone to tell me what to do. And so I think it's a mindset shift where people, they don't understand. They think like, well, if this doesn't work, I'm going to take a step backwards, but you're really not because you can always go get a nine to five job. The only way, in my opinion, financially to get to where you want is you have to either a run your own business or B, you're a very high executive or you're a sales rep or someone who has that high earning potential and multiple six figures a year. But for most people, you know, that, that will never happen doing a normal job. And so for me, I was like, well, it's either I take the leap and I figure it out or I just have a normal job the rest of my life anyway. So what's, what am I really losing? And I think that's, I think more people, they're just worried about what other people think because they don't want to live in a bad place. They don't want to have a bad car. 
I just got over it because I was prideful. And then I was like, well, my way's not working. So I'm just going to go ahead and go all in. And worst case, I'll go live at my parents' house, I guess. That's how I thought. Yeah, it's interesting. How does somebody gain that skill, right? Because, you know, at a young age, you want to be cool. You want to fit in. Everybody wants to drive Ferraris. You know, you want to impress the girls or, you know, maybe the girls... Maybe they're not trying to press the guys, but they're trying to look cool in front of the other girls, right? What would you tell someone like that that's like, man, you know, I don't want to be looked at as a bum in front of these people that they don't really know my situation, but I might have to do that to get to the next level. And that's something that you got over because you were a work, you worked out, you, you obviously cared about your body, you cared about your image, you cared yeah. about what people thought about you. We all do, right? But there came a time where you kind of said, fuck it, like, I don't care anymore. I need to focus on what's important. I think that's a skill. And a lot of people don't have that skill. How does somebody gain that skill? Well, I think one, um, you know, I think I, I think parents play a bigger role in our lives than some people take it for. So something that I'm very grateful for my father was, you know, we've had our ups and downs, but he never gave me money uh, for anything. And at the time, it really pissed me off. But it taught me it was like, you, this is your life. You have to figure it out. Like you're not just going to get bailed out. And he wouldn't give me money. And like, even when I went to college, um, the only way I was able to go to college was through scholarships. And I even remember I was like gonna apply for financial aid at one point. And they're like, yeah, your dad makes too much money. My dad's like, I'm not paying for that. You know, <laughs> so it was it was that. And then the second thing I just think is as you get older and that that's the hard part when you're a young kid, it's hard for you to understand. But I think a few moments hit me like the day I graduated high school and then when I turned 25, like it just hit me like a ton of bricks where I'm like, I'm never going to see these people again. Who cares what they think? And you, I think you get to a point in your life where you realize that too. It, it's funny because I bought a Lamborghini recently and it was just a life goal for me. But the irony is whenever I have a girlfriend, I actually don't care about the Lamborghini. I started thinking why. And I was like, well, half the reason I get the Lamborghini is so people think I'm cool. Yes. Why would I be honest with myself, right? So I'm sitting here laughing. I go, but as soon as I get a girlfriend, I don't care what all the other girls think. So I don't care about the Lamborghini anymore. It's actually just being honest with yourself. So I just think you got to get to a point in life where you only got 80 years to live on average, give or take. And you, you might as well just do what you want to do. Because right. at the end of the day, I, I just am not happy when I'm not doing the stuff I want to do. And so I just realize, okay, I can't be the professional athlete I wanted to be. I'm not going to be a musician or a singer. So I got to be a businessman. And when I had, when I, that was a clear path for me, it's like the only way to get rich or like financially successful and live the lifestyle you want is this way. I was like, all right, well, that's the only way. So that's what I have to do. So it wasn't, it was never really an option for me. It just, over time, I realized like, okay, this is the only path. So you either do it or you don't. And I think having that athlete, the, my dad and then also being a former athlete, I think that really helps with the mentality of like just work, work ethic. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. So what did sports and, you know, fitness, because obviously you made your money initially with fitness and you were, you know, into bodybuilding or physique building or whatever, right? Yeah. You care about your physique, you care about your health, right? What were some of the lessons that you learned in the weight room or maybe on the field that now you implement with dealing with employees and dealing with partnerships and all these things that maybe you can relate? They don't, they don't directly relate, but they indirectly relate. Yeah, so I, I think the first thing is just being able to understand that, you know, David Goggins, he, he, his book is perfect. Right. Like I have the same mindset as David Goggins. Now, do do I feel the need to go run eight trillion miles like him and like have my skin fall off my hands? No. But I know that that's the same mindset I have where it's like if I knew I needed to do that, I could do it. And I think a lot of people lack um, perseverance. You know, the first time something goes wrong, they quit. And even in business, like I've been full time about three years now, you know, it's not not every month, no matter how big your business is, is always just like, oh yeah, like 80% margin and like nothing went wrong and all, like it's not like that. And people, I think a lot of people, they just can't take a lot of hits or uh, they can't go through a lot of things. So I think with sports, especially playing at a higher level and just being in Texas where football is huge, you just learn it's like to beat out other players and be a better player. Yes, some of it is physical ability, but I was like, if I outwork these players, and I have the same physical ability, 
all win. And so that took me all the way to the D1 level where then I finally met the guys who physical ability was so superior to mine that it was like, okay, that's why you're a first round draft pick. But I think for most people in business and other things where there's no athleticism involved, it just really comes down to like, no matter how smart or dumb or all these things that people have, if you're, as long as you have some logical reasoning and you try something that doesn't work and you do this, as long as you keep going, you will figure it out. And I truly believe that it's not, unless you run out of money or you run out of time, I mean, even then there's so, there's a lot of businesses you can start without money. So that's kind of my mindset with it. And, and I just take it as a personal thing for me to, like, I just am not a quitter. And my dad just taught me not to do that. And so I, I don't know, there's something inside me that just wants me to be the best I can be. And I think some people have that fire and some don't, but I do think sports helped with that because it's, it's very competitive and, and you want to be the best. Yes, I agree. I agree. I wrestled my whole life. And if anyone's been on a wrestling team, they know that it's the worst part is practice. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's the worst. It's the worst cardio yeah. ever, man. It's like, <laughs> wait, yeah, worse it's not, yeah, I played, it's funny because I played baseball and I played wrestling. So I would say re- baseball is probably the easiest sport to practice and wrestling is the hardest sport to practice. So I did, I did both. I did a little cross train and I would always go to the baseball field and be like, man, these kids are soft, you know, like they're complaining. They're like hanging out, chewing, you know, they're doing tobacco in the outfield. They're chewing sunflower seeds, big league chew for all my baseball fans out there uh, that grew up playing ball. So it, it was a completely different mindset. You got the wrestlers are like getting slammed, poked in the eye, can't see you twisted toes, twisted arms, and you still come to practice. It's just a totally different mindset shift. Uh-huh. And I feel like you have to have that wrestling mindset in business because you're going to get hit with a lot of missiles and you got to kind of have to be re- uh, relentless in the field. And I, I feel like that's a lot of things. Uh, a lot of the times when, you know, people get to your level, they've acquired those skills. And I want to talk about that. You know, you've been to Funnel Hacking Live and you, you've been on stage. You have the plaques, everything. Everybody knows how important those plaques are that is trying to make it in the online space. With networking with all these high individuals like Brunson and all these people, what were some of the key differentiating factors that you see that all these people have in common that the average Joe doesn't? Man, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's going to sound cliche, but I think it goes back to that perseverance. I mean, it was it was funny the other day I was talking to my COO. Um, and I presented at war room last week with like Ryan Dice and, you know, you got Russell and they got their bad stories too. It's just, you never hear about them. Yes. But I mean, a few, a few years before click funnels took off for Russell, Russell was in some deep, uh, doo doo for another company he was running and, and, you know, Ryan Dice has definitely had up and downs with digital marketers. So, uh, I, I mean, it, it's, there's just, I, I don't know how to explain it, but I just think some people, they just, they want they want something so bad and they want to, whether it's their mission for what they're actually building or they just want to be the best they can be. I think it just drives them to not quit because the alternative is what, like what's the alternative to quitting? Like you go live an average life. And and I just know from personal experience when football ended, you know, I was a football player. That's how I viewed myself. And then I was going to school, and it was fun for a few months. It was nice to relax. And I was like, oh my gosh, like first time in 12 years, I don't have to do stuff. And I'm not having to like lift 300 pounds and all those things. But mm. you know, the reason I dropped out of school, I was sitting in engineering class, I had a year left. You know, I had a 3.9 GPA or something. And I just was sitting here and I was looking at the class and it's like, is this, is this what I'm gonna do the rest of my life until I retire? And that thought scared me so much that my whole life was gonna be the same old every day that I literally just got up, I left and that was it. And, and and that's what made me go be a server and do door to door. Cause I just knew, I was like, there's gotta be something more to life than that. And so I, I think a lot of the top guys I talk to, they just have very high tenacity and perseverance compared to the average person. And they yeah, just, would you say, go ahead. Yeah, would you, would you say it's more, you know, kind of like adaptability, right? Uh, because I feel like when you're running ads, let's say for Facebook ads example, right? You're a Facebook ad, you know, expert, you, you, you're doing seven, eight figures in one funnel, right? How important is it to like keep testing and switching up, right? Cause I feel like a lot of people, they just, they think they need the one thing, the one ad, and then that ad goes to shit. And now they're, you know, now they're depressed. How important is it to keep adjusting with, with, you know, tactical stuff 
like Facebook ads or Google ads, YouTube ads in your funnels and right. adjusting the copyright and uh, the copying and everything. And also yeah. with the mindset too, being able to like, okay, well this didn't work, but we got to keep going. Well, yeah, I think the irony in funnels and stuff is that a lot of people, they overestimate how well these funnels work and they underestimate how much is going on on the back end. So to give you an example, that was me. I was like, man, this guy just, all they do is they run traffic to the funnel and people sign up and they're millionaires. So I was like, that's easy. I want that. But when I start looking closer, I'm like, well, actually they have a full sales team who calls every single lead three, four, five, six times till they pick up. Then they text them if they don't, then they email them. Then they do it again for the next seven days. Then they're retarded. You know, like there's all these other things that go into play. So like even right now, this this year um, with ads has not been quite as profitable as it was last year. And so to be honest with you, instead of looking at like, yeah, we've changed some of the ads and that, but really I'm looking like, okay, how else can we get the sales team involved sooner so there's more personal touch? Because usually what you'll find, at least in my opinion, with the bigger companies I've seen in the direct response market at least, is that's a common thread with the bigger companies, is they have a savage you know, sales team, they have a lot of people reaching out manually, and they're doing stuff that's quote unquote unscalable uh, for most people because it's really easy to rip a funnel, it's really easy to rip someone's ad, but what I've seen that isn't easy for people to rip is kind of that back end work that takes a team and is it's a lot of hard work. So therefore less people are going to do it. Um, right. But yeah, to your point, I mean, when stuff stops working, it's the same thing. Are you going to quit or are you going to find a new way? Um, <laughs> so yeah, I agree. Yeah. That's, that's an interesting point. I feel with all, with all these things, right. Whether you're running Google ads or Facebook ads and YouTube ads, whatever, you know, it's not going to be perfect every time. You might have one that you're like, oh shit, that one worked. And then it might stop out of nowhere, right? I know a lot of people in this space that they had a funnel running, 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 and Facebook took down their ad. And now that's it, done. The salespeople are, they're waiting around like, where are the leads? They're checking their calendar. There's no leads on the board, right? I think it's interesting. I, th I think it's interesting for, you know, someone like you to, be in fitness and then adjust and now you're doing full-time consulting and now you're writing and now you have a book out what what made you want to write this book does this book mean a lot to you did you write this for your legacy so your kids kids be like man my my great great grandfather tanner wrote this book and i have like the hard copy and they pass it down because because nobody like let's face it unless you're assigned to like penguin or something nobody makes money in books uh people make money with book funnels leveraging sure. their book but nobody makes money with actual books, right? So did you write this book for you and your legacy and uh, you know your last name? Or was there another reason why you wrote this? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so first off, I just think it's a bucket list. You know, there's like even owning the Lamborghini, even though I don't care about it at all anymore, it's literally sitting in a garage and the battery died and I haven't driven it in <laughs> forever. The Lamborghini battery died? Yeah, well, yeah, because you got to drive it so often. Yeah. I go yeah. in there, it's completely dead. Anyways, but uh, I, it was that. And then the other thing is, you know, my journey that made it so frustrating is even when I started making money, I was hustling, getting all these deals organically. So every coach I was paying, the whole point was like, hey, I'm going to pay them so they'll teach me ads so I don't have to keep hustling. Um, and I had to go through five different coaches. I spent about $50,000 uh to figure that out and and it was very it was very discouraging because you know i'm sitting here like man i'm a 20 young 20 year old kid and um even if they do, were doing their best i felt at times i was like man this is like kind of shit. like this isn't really good um and so when i persevered and went through the first thought i had was you know, I did that, but I feel like my mentality is much higher than the average person in terms of what I can deal with. Right. I have a very high tolerance for pain. And so I'm sitting here going, you know, if the average person came to me or went to that guy and gave them their last bit of money, what would happen? And so that's kind of what, that's kind of also what made me want to write the book. Cause if you go in the book, besides, I think like one review, like we have all these good reviews. You see like that one person's like, bro, what? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was very you like crazy. put it under a microscope and you're like this, yeah. little, this little fucker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, it's, it's, very, it's very tactical. Like I go in there and I say everything I did and I try to explain it as best I can without a visual because it's obviously it's 
you're reading, you're not, you're not seeing, but you know, dude, at the end of the day, I, I just want, I want everyone to have a good life and I know what it feels like to not have a lot. Um, and I know what it feels like to be demoralized and feel like what, you know, what does this guy have that I don't? And so when I finally figured it out and it was just a few simple things, um, I was like, you know what, shoot, if I could help someone figure this out in their first 10 K instead of their, you know, fifth 10 K, uh, that'll, that'll change their life dramatically. And so that, that's where I find most of the reward. I'll be honest, like, as I'm progressing and getting older, I want to do bigger things. Uh, if that makes sense, like I don't just want to be a direct marketer the rest of my life, but it, it is rewarding when someone comes to you and they're like, Tanner, like I did a hundred thousand dollars last month and I literally left my nine to five. And like, like that's a, that's a good feeling. Cause I think there's a lot of things you can do to help people. But the one thing I like about helping people financially is, you know, if they need a therapist, they can now afford it. They're expensive. If they need a doctor, they can get it. If they have kids, they can provide for them. So while it's nice, like you can help people in all these different ways, money is the one way that's like, whatever they need help with, they can now usually get that help. And so that's kind of the reward for me and why I wrote the book. Yeah, I agree. You know, it's a good marketing piece with the Lamborghini with the dead battery. Like even the Lamborghini does. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I just, and then you like sitting on the Lamborghini, like like all oh, like pissed off like this, and the Lamborghini's dead. It's just funny, man. Like at the end of the day, you know, I'm a I'm still in my 20s, but you start realizing that no matter how many things you buy, or no matter how many girls you hook up with, or whatever, like it really it really doesn't make you that happy. And yeah. so as I've started realizing that what I've actually learned is like by having less liabilities, that's actually what allows you to do whatever you want because, you know, I want to build another company after this. I was, I was sitting here thinking about this the other day. The biggest benefit I have is I don't really own anything besides my two cars. So if I really like if everything imploded today, I could literally sit and do nothing and be fine and, and spend my time on what I want to spend my time with. And I, I've heard Alex Becker talk about that a few times. He kind of had a similar trajectory where he bought a bunch of stuff, and then he got rid of it. Um, right. But anyways, that, that's that's a little tangent. Oh. But. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to ask you some questions about you know your consulting, your course, right? Because this is going to clear a lot of the airways, right? This actually might get you more sales in the long run. No. All right. So this is, this is like straight to the point. I'm a very straight to the point, black and white uh, type guy. You, you coach people. There's a million people that coach people. Why would someone come to you over the next guy? Yeah. The first, the first reason I usually give people is that I built a seven figure B2C business before I ever business consulted. So not saying it's bad, but the thing that used to run me is I was like, Hey, what business have you ran? Well, I, I'm a business coach. Well, what's the business you ran before that? Oh, it was just this. So I was like, so you're business coaching people, but you've never like grown a business outside of that. Right not bad. I'm not saying I'm not trying to throw shade on anyone. I just, that was for me. And then, you know, the second thing is that I did it in such a short amount of time, you know, so someone will be like, well, I've been in business 25 years, Tanner. And I, you know, I do 400 a month and I, that's great. That's not to say bad, but I'm like, well, dude, if I've been in business for two years and you know, I've, I'm doing seven figures a month, wouldn't that make sense to like get more help for me or someone else similar, you know? So I think it's yep. the speed of trajectory of how fast it happened for me. Um, and then I think the other thing is like, I actually, it was very important to me that I built a seven figure business in something else before I business consulted, because that was my whole rub. I just, it got me so mad. Cause like, bro, like, what did you do before? And these were with coaching experiences where I had a bad experience. And so that's what got me upset because, I, because I said, yep. you're telling me to do something, but you've never <laughs> done it. And so how do you know if it's going to work? So when I, everything I've done, I actually do. And that's, that it just at least feels better to me when I tell someone that I'm like, I've actually done this. I've actually done it in something besides this. It works. People are asking for help. And so, yes, hopefully that makes sense. No, it absolutely. makes sense. Right. Cause a lot of people are going to ask that. And the problem is when they don't have access to talking to someone, whether it's you or Ty Lopez or Grant Cardone, they're always going to wonder, right? People yeah. assume. So I like to clear, I like to clear the airways and sure. uh, potentially, you know, give you the opportunity to help more people right because that's what people think right they see your ads and they see you and they're like okay who you know who's this who's this guy this tanner guy okay cool this is the but yeah, yeah. <laughs> well you're not you're actually you're actually a cool guy and actually a really nice guy but nobody knows that until you jump on a podcast or you know a tv show or whatever because you're just seeing ads right and your ads are funny like i like your ads um 
Okay, so they go they go into your course. They go into your. Do you have it done for you, or is it just is just? Um... Yeah, so, so it's it's a done with you. So what I do is okay. we, we basically take it's a hybrid of one to one and group, and so they have a dedicated one to one coach who they can message at any time, and then they can get on Zooms as needed. The only reason we say as needed, not unlimited anymore, is you can yeah. imagine the abuse that started happening. Yeah. With that. So. They can get on Zooms like this and share their screen. And then we also have a daily office hour and a daily call on a specific topic. And they can also hop on one-to-one -one calls with those like ad specialists or a copy specialist. So, um, and we have the portal and we do live events. So like, in my opinion, at the scale we're at, you know, uh, you know, we're doing eight figures a year. As far as I know, I don't know anyone who's doing all of that and still is doing eight figures. So I usually tell people yeah. too, it's like, you know, if you usually work with a bigger company, you you might get a lesser service because they're so big that you're just you're just a number. But what, what I've tried to do is like scale, but also make it so that it's still very personable. It's still very one to one because that I think was very important to me in my growth is just having someone I could quickly ask a question. They shoot it back, and then I would go implement. So, uh, Tanner, my my Zoom's not working. I, I need you to jump on right now. I need, I need you to FaceTime, FaceTime. Yeah, it was like that. And so we're like, so look, you can get help as much as you need, but it, sometimes it would be like, we get on a call and tell them what to do. And then we're like, do that and then come back to us. And then they'd want to get on another call. We're like, well, did you do it? No. Right. So obviously at scale, we had to set those parameters. But as far as I know, and as I'm aware that that's, that's one of the highest levels of service out there for yeah. the amount of money we're making. So I have to I have to ask you this for future clients, existing clients, right? You have thousands of clients, right? You're one of the highest level guys in this field. You're like you're at the highest level of the internet marketing space. With all the people that you see, why do people that buy courses? It doesn't have to be yours. It could be anyone's. Yeah. Why when they buy courses or they do a done with you or they do a done for you? Why do the people that succeed succeed and why do the people that fail fail? Is it purely they just don't you know they don't have uh the tenacity to keep going or is it you know some people don't have it right maybe they're not marketable well what do you think it is with all the people because you have thousands of clients now you have yeah. all that data so, so the yes yeah, so the data from the best clients is one typically they have a higher than average work ethic meaning that they they will i'll tell them something and that's all they need and they'll do it they don't need I wouldn't even say handholding is bad. It's just they have a higher than average work ethic. They are willing to work longer hours and go through and persevere more and deal with more hardship than the average person. And then the other thing is they just usually, I would say they have more of a disposition to understand marketing and sales. So some of, like one guy, for example, came over, he was a sales rep. You can imagine you plug a sales guy into online marketing. He's like, oh, yeah, like I already done sales. This is easy. Or you take a girl who was a personal trainer who did bikini shows and was a coach for another uh, business consultant. And then she came over and you just so some of the people I think they have a great work ethic. And then my best clients, they just they're good at those skills. So mm -hmm. like anything, like if you're really bad at messaging and you're really bad at sales, it's really hard to build a big business because you're hoping that essentially you can hire people who are better than you, which typically isn't going to happen. If the CEO typically is not good at sales in my experience, it's very hard to get past a certain threshold of revenue because when they bring people on, they're looking to them to show them what to do. Right. So that that's, those are probably the two biggest things. Now I will say, even if you're bad at something, the benefit of business versus a sport, is in sports, there were literally guys who never worked out and they still were faster than me or stronger than me. I mean, that, there's nothing I can do. I was training. Uh, if you saw me train back in the day, I mean, it was how I do business, not mm -hmm. six, nine, 10 hours a day, just eat, sleep, eat, train, sleep, go repeat. So I will say in business is that if they're willing to work at it long enough, I really think anyone can figure it out. It's just some people, they don't have that mindset, you know? So yeah. I had a conversation with my old mentor. And, you know, we were like, not everyone should own a business. Some people are just meant to maybe have a job, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with yeah. that. Position and players. I just think it comes down to more of that mentality. They don't have the work ethic and they don't have the, the willingness to kind of push through because that's just the reality in business, man. It, it's not always perfect. I, I can almost guarantee that anyone, someone who's watching this has seen who has an eight figure or nine figure business and they think it's all roses. No. Like everyone's had bad months. Everyone's had bad years. Everyone's had 
uh, people leave or they've probably had some lawsuit or some like, <laughs> it's not, yeah. it's not just like always great. So I think, um, those are the two biggest things though, for sure. Work ethic. And then I would say just, they have a more natural disposition to learn those skills. Yeah. I feel like there's a bis big misconception with the online space of how much money you have to spend realistically. Right. And let's say, so I have this is a two part question for you because you are an expert at the highest level. If someone doesn't know how to run Facebook ads or anything, they don't, they've never ran a campaign when they open up ad manager, it looks like, you know, for English speakers, it looks like Chinese, right? Sure. So that person even attempted, or so they just hire a media buyer, hire a tech guy right away because they have no hope. It's like me trying to play LeBron James one on one. I have no hope. Yeah. Is it kind of like that with that in that situation? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a sticky. Like realistically, part. right? Because yeah. people advertise like, oh, you join my course and you'll learn this and all this bullshit. But then when you get behind the computer, like, I don't know anything. Yeah. So I think it depends. I mean, so for me, like, I was able to. I was able to learn Facebook ads by taking a few courses. So that really did help. Cause like Facebook ads, in my opinion, isn't too complicated. I think YouTube ads is a little more complicated for a beginner to learn. Mm -hmm. um, but it depends because here's the downside. So you hire someone to do something you don't understand. Typically what will happen is because you don't understand it, you don't know what numbers to look for. You don't know if they're good or bad. So when you go ask that agency, the person running your ads, Hey, like what's going on? What ends up happening is usually they stick with them three months longer than they should have because they just don't they don't know if it's going well or bad because all when they ask the agency's like oh yeah it just takes time or or it does this right they can say whatever they want so in my opinion like let me put it to you this way let's say the average agency is five grand well if all you have is five grand for ads or let's say you have seven grand you're better off spending the seven grand yourself figuring it out than spending five on the agency and two on ads because but they may not know that. But if you think about ads, right, if an average lead is 10 bucks yeah. and, you, and you're due three times as worse, it's probably the exact same results, but you actually learn from it. So in my experience, I, I'm a big believer in really knowing how to do it yourself first because it becomes very difficult to build a team on processes you don't understand unless it's someone on the back, like behind the scenes. So like with Russell Brunson, he doesn't know how to code, but he had Todd Dickerson. Right. So something like that. But in terms of like sales or marketing or ads, it's in my opinion, I wouldn't do it because the downside is you don't know if you're being screwed in a sense. And that's very risky in a business, in my opinion. So I, I personally would say, you know, for most people, if you have enough money to hire a media buyer, then you're probably smart enough to learn it. And if you don't have enough money to hire a media buyer, you're better off just trying it on your own and maybe taking a basic course or something like that. That's just that's just my opinion because yeah. again, like if you have seven grand and you get five to a media buyer and then you can only spend two, you're better off just spending the seven and buy yourself. Because right. even if you get worse results, you spent more money, so you don't have to get as this you don't have to have as low a cost. Hopefully that makes sense. No, it makes it definitely makes sense. Well, what if you're not a marketing person? Like you're not creative. You, you're just a sales guy and you want to create your own business. Like you're not marketing. You're not creative. You don't like your ads are kind of corny. They're not marketing. way. Does that guy have no hope? Is he a lost cause? No, nah, I mean, honest, sales, honestly, sales, sales, sales is definitely the most important. I mean, and look, to be honest, there's people who can, you can run a business without running ads. Now it's going to be a little harder. You're not going to make seven figures a month, right? I don't, I don't think, I don't think anyone doing seven figures a month is legit doing 100% organic, which means you're not running any ads. Most of the time they'll say, oh, I run ads in my Facebook group, it's organic. It's like, no, that's that's still ads. Um, but you can still make six figures a month doing organic. But I mean, I think getting someone who's creative, I'll, I'll say this, like, I, it's very rare I meet an owner who hires out ads. Cause like, there's, I have a good friend right now, he's doing quite a bit of revenue and he's hired out his, uh, his ads, but, he knows enough to where like he knows what the average lead cost should be, he knows what the average ad cost should be. That's what I mean by that. I think if you don't know any of that, that's dangerous. But no, like there's definitely people who I think are more sales oriented. Like I look at Grant Cardone. Uh, I don't think Grant knows anything about what's going on with his marketing. I think he's a great sales guy, but like I don't think he has a clue on like who's running the ads and what the case. I don't think he knows any of that. So it's right. definitely doable. I just think. Um, you know, at a smaller scale, it's it's a little more risky, but it's definitely learnable. I don't I don't think if you don't know that you can't start a company. Uh, as as the company grows, you kind of learn 
things as you go along as well. So I didn't know how to hire and train people very well. And as the company grew and I made mistakes, I was like, do this, don't do that. <laughs> I mean, realistically, right? Let's say someone doesn't, they've never ran an ad and they want to be successful. What do you think that person has to spend typically, right? Like, I feel like a lot of people in this space, they have a big, big misconception that it's like, okay, I got $1,000. I'm going to put $1,000 into Facebook ads or YouTube ads, and I'm going to make my money back at 10 times the amount of rate. I, I read the 10X rule. I'm ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I usually say at least $3,000. So 100 bucks a day minimum, because I mean, even at a $10 lead, if you're getting less than 10 leads a day, it, it's... I just, I don't see the point uh, because the buying cycle, like especially for high tickets. So let's say you get one call for 200 bucks at, at 10, you know, if you're spending $10 a day, it's going to take you 20 days to get a call. It's that, that's not worth it. Um, but it, it also depends on the funnel. So I'll say this, like if you're running an automatic funnel and you're just hoping that all the leads come through and they just take action on their own, that's one thing. But if you're calling or you're messaging every single lead that comes in, you can get away with a little less spend. But typically, I, if, if I had a client, I'll say, look, if you can't spend at least 100 bucks a day and make no money that month and be OK, you're not ready for ads. Right. Because mm -hmm. what I did is I went out, I got clients organically, started making money. And then I was like, OK, I'm making you know, 30, 50 K a month. Now I'm going to put this in the ads so I can make more. As is right. to amplify what's working, what a lot of people don't you know, get is they like, well, I'm struggling organically. I'm like, well, you're going to struggle with that. Ads is harder than organic because these people literally don't know you at all. Like they have no idea who you are. They see a million ads. So, um, but it's usually a hundred bucks a day to answer your question. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think that's good. Cause a lot of people, uh, they're kind of in the dark with that. They think they're going to put a thousand dollars in and make 10 grand back every time. And, and they don't have the foundation. They're not, they don't have any press about them. They don't have a book they're, They haven't done a Ted talk. They, they have nothing. There's, you know, Larry down the street, you know, I think well, that's yeah. a big, big misconception. Well, and that they'll see someone like Ty Lopez, Grant Cardone, Russell. And, and mm -hmm. I'm like, that's one of the benefits of really growing a brand and getting bigger is it's the same thing for me. Like my ads have gotten easier over the years because more people know me, but you know, they're like, well, Grant Cardone does. I'm like, guys, Grant Cardone or Tony Robbins, for example, like they can do, they can get away with stuff that the average person can't do. And sometimes they don't get that. Right. So that's the other thing. Yeah. Got it. Okay, cool. So we, we've established that the only way you fail is if you give up. Right. And, you shouldn't do ads unless your organic stuff is working. Is that fair to say? Yeah, like like for my clients, for example, I, I tell them to get at least two or three clients organically and then you can move right. to ads. That it's proof of concept. It proves that you know how to close a deal from A to you know, A to Z, and then it's less risky for ads. I mean, there's nothing wrong with ads. It's just most people, if they dive straight into ads, they'll fail because yeah. they have no clue what's going on. What was the feeling that you got when you sold so two questions, right? What was the feeling when you sold your first high ticket sale? And what was the feeling that you got when your clients sold their first high ticket sale? <laughs> so when I made my first sale, I was, I was happy, but I was also, I was upset. I was actually visibly upset because I had been working so hard the last two years. I had nothing to show for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was, I was this close of going back to school. And so when I made that sale in my head, I was like, you gotta be effing kidding me. Like, I was this close the whole time because all I changed, all I changed was a set of selling a $47 product. I raised it to 1500 and got them on a phone. That was all I did. And, and, and it took me two years to figure that out. Um, my first two clients were some of my best clients I ever had, ironically. So they both went zero to 10 K in 30 days. And I'm like, man, I'm gonna be a billionaire. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I'm gonna be a billionaire. Like my system's dope. Um, yeah, yeah. Obviously, as you work with other people, you know, different people come in with different abilities and skills, and so you start realizing not every person is gonna get the same level of income and revenue. Uh, but no, it was a good feeling. It was it was cool to see that, you know, what was working for me was also working for someone else, and it was more predictable. One of the things I like in my business model is I try to teach people more predictable stuff than. Mm. You know, I never liked running ads and just cross my fingers like, please work, like, please, please, like, sign up for a call. And so I do a lot of aggressive outreach uh, through different mediums. And I think that's one of the things that makes my clients on average more successful than other companies, because mm. it's like, look, if it works great, if your VSL works great, your webinar, but if it doesn't, 
then we go to plan B and we do this every single time. And for the average beginner, I mean, how good are they on video? We all know they're, they're bad. Right. And how good are they with tech? It's, it's not good. So to yeah. try to teach a beginner, in my opinion, how to run a fully automated webinar that they never have to touch and da da da. I'm not a big fan of that personally, not saying they can't work, but I'm not a fan of that. Yeah. Crafting your message, being in front of the camera, you know, being able to sell in front of the camera, it's a big difference. And uh, it's like selling on stage, completely different animal. Yeah. hundred Yeah. So I just want to ask you, where does Tanner see himself in the next five, 10 years? Are you going to keep, you know, staying on the online space? Are you going to start doing real estate? What is Tanner's, uh, you know, Tanner's legacy look like? Where, what direction are you trying to go into? Yeah. So, I mean, for the time being, I'm not planning on, uh, getting rid of the company. Like, you know, I'm sure any CEO is watching this kind of feels the same thing of like, you want to take care of your team. I didn't really understand that until I got a big team and I'm like, if I just shut the company down, you know, like all these people lose their livelihoods. It's not a good feeling. Right. So I definitely want to step out more. I have been, um, but I want the business to continue to run, but I've really, I've really been thinking about, um, doing a tech startup or something just bigger, you know, something that's, um, you know, I wouldn't even say like quote unquote real business, right? Like sometimes people will say like online business, a real business, a real business. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I'm really, I'm really thinking about that. I need to do some more research and like, I've really been looking into other companies, but it, it, you know, it's, it would be exciting to me. I think like, I feel like I've dominated, this space as much as I can, you get to a point where it's like, Oh, if I do 1.7 million instead of 1.5 or two, it, it's, it kind of is like whatever, right. It doesn't give you the same fulfillment. Um, so for me, I would really like to step into another space where I am doing something else that obviously I care about, but has a much higher potential, you know, hundred million, a billion dollar valuation. And, you know, that's obviously a much bigger goal than I had now. I mean, my, my goal when I started, this was to make a hundred thousand a month. You know, now I'm like, oh, let's do, you know, 25 million this year, but it's a much bigger goal, but I don't, I don't know where it's going to happen with that, but I've definitely been thinking right. about kind of moving that direction just for a variety of reasons. I, I enjoy tech. It's interesting to me. They have very high valuations. I, I, I like the, the structure. It's a lot less risk than say, you know, a physical product or something. So we'll see, but I, I definitely am feeling kind of, I need a new challenge and, and that's, that's part of what's made me successful. It's also part of the downside of my personality, but right. I just like to always push myself and kind of be the, you know, everything I can be per se. Yeah, no, that's good. That's why you are where you are, you know, because you're never satisfied. You enjoy the process, but you're never satisfied. That's why you have a, you know, a car in your garage with a dead battery. <laughs> most people, most people would be flexing on the weekends. Exactly, man. If you, if you do what I do, you can also have a dead car in your garage. <laughs> there you go. That's, that's your marketing piece right there. <laughs> what's some of what's some of Tanner's daily habits, morning routines? What, what did you eat for breakfast today? So uh, I usually don't eat breakfast. Uh, I like to fast. I, I just I just feel like it just keeps me leaner, and I just mm. feel better. I like I like having bigger meals. That's my mom's fault when I play football. Um, I get up every day very early, and I go to the gym. It's the first thing I like to do. Uh, I try to meditate, and then I'll start hammering out my team meetings, and then after that, I'll do whatever else is on my schedule. So, you know, if I'm on this or uh, sometimes if we have a new sales guy and my sales manager is slammed, I'll get on a call with my sales guy. But for the most part, it's really just kind of directing the team and managing at this point. It's like making How, sure that it's done, yeah. that's, et cetera. Yeah. How important do you think, you know, Tanner's morning routine is? Do you think that you'd be able to put out the same amount of effort and efficiency if you didn't meditate, if you didn't, you know, maybe fast in the morning or... You know, because I feel like a lot of people, they wake up and they just start reacting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I, I used to do that. So when I was a solopreneur, I had a smaller team. I did do that. And it, and it really, it's really not good, though. It really can start to affect your health um, and just your mind, you, you know, mentally. Um, so one of the important things for me is, you know, being a, a business owner, you, it's stressful at times. There's a bunch of you got to pay the bills. The ads aren't working as well. Clients are complaining. Your team's complain. Like there's just a lot of responsibility. So for me, the gym is really a stress relief. Like people think, you know, it's not really physical for me at all. It's, it's, it's how I go get my stress out. And I feel like if I didn't, and that's why people do drugs and alcohol because they need a release. 
Um, so that's kind of just the release for me. And then it, it does set the precedent for the day. You know, so like when people are like, yeah. you, get up, you make a bed, you work out, you do this, it sets you on that good path. And then it makes the rest of the day a little better. If I miss it or I sleep in or I eat like a really nasty breakfast or, you know, I, I drank last night, I kind of notice that carries on into my day as well. So for, for me, it just kind of helps clear my mind and make me focus. And then it's a little more easier for me to work throughout the day. Yeah. Also, I want to I want to put in here before I forget that Tanner actually employed you employed your br little brothers, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think that a lot of people that's a big dream is to employ their family. I think that's pretty remarkable from your standpoint. People dream of that. Like a lot of people want to have be rich and have Ferraris and press girls and all this shit. But I think even bigger picture is being able to employ your family, like giving your little brother like here here's a roadmap. I I had a get kicked in the nuts but now i know what to do and now i can employ you i think that's huge well, i think a lot of, that goes under the rug yeah and i mean just you know hopefully he doesn't get mad at me if i shared too much but you know one of my uh one of my brothers um him and his wife they they had a kiddo that they weren't expecting you know he's 21 years old hmm. right and then he has type 1 diabetes and my other brother just got home uh, he went on a two-year uh, mission and then he came home and he was going back to school so you know these guys are making zero income they're living in absolute crap my brother with type 1 diabetes to take care of the kid uh, now is basically he wasn't sure if he should go to school or what he should do and so he starts working on roofs in the hot sun and you know with type 1 diabetes your health is up and down and your blood it's all over the place and so it was, it was awesome you know, to be able to like give him a sales rep position where he makes as high as 40 K a month. And he's, you know, he's in his early twenties. And I'm like, dude, you're in the top 1% of income in the whole world. Like people don't make that amount of money at your age. So, you know, it, that it's a blessing from that standpoint, because it's like, it helps me do what I want to do and I have to pay someone to do it. So if it can be my family and they do a good job, um, great. And, and that's, that's the other blessing is the way my dad raised me. Uh, fortunately they work very hard. Uh, some people hire their family and it's not a good experience because right. they, it gets the personal and the business do not mesh. But luckily, my brothers, I can absolutely rail them in the business. Yeah. And then we hang they up. Know. And we're all good. Yeah, yeah. we're all yeah. good. I mean, it must be fulfilling, right? Like when you're laying in bed at night, you're looking at the popcorn on the ceiling and you're relaxing. You're like, man, like I built this huge fucking business and now my 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 family is safe. Yeah, that, I mean, that's that's what kind of keeps driving me is like when people, when I'm thinking about retirement and how much money I want to make, I want to make enough that basically yeah. my family will be good for forever unless some idiot comes along and, you know, right. ruins it for us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, well, I don't, like the, I don't the think that's going to happen. He gets born into it or something and he messes up the trust fund or something. I don't know. Yeah. But, but, but at least I'll have your book and it'll be like, yo, my great, great, great grandfather Tanner, that guy was a badass. There you go. <laughs> cool, oh, cool, man. So I, have, I always ask people three questions on the end of the show. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to hear your answers. Sure. If Tanner had a superpower or if Tanner does have a superpower, what is Tanner's superpower? Oh, dude, it'd be tele teleporting for sure. I mean, <laughs> I think it'd be so cool at any time. Like you could just snap your fingers, then you're in a different spot and you could like meet up with a person. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that'd make life way more interesting because yeah could happen whenever yeah I love you come that. up like a hologram and you and you pop up like star wars yeah like i just think it'd be cool if you could snap your fingers I, i'm curious like maybe who knows yeah i'm like we're old guys maybe someone's gonna come up with something like that you know i don't know with how fast technology's moving but yeah that's always been what i said people say to fly i'm like dude i just want to teleport yeah I'm fly like, just jump we all we just jump on delta you're good <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, exactly. so well what is your business superpower right what is tanner's superpower in uh, business or as maybe you know a brother maybe as a son I think, I think overall I'm good with people. Sometimes I can be a little too aggressive and I've had to learn how to kind of tame that back. But overall, I think I'm really good at understanding, like, here's what I want this person to do for me. And here's what this person wants me to do for them and being able to have very open discussions. So like one of the things I'm the most proud of is I have no attrition in my company except front end employees or someone who wants to go like they want to leave and start their own business i've never had anyone leave because like they weren't happy or we had to fire them or something like that uh, 
it's like all I've had people stay with me since the beginning of my business all the way through who are my man managers now. And I think a big part of that is just they feel I, I get crazy sometimes. I did it a little bit this morning, actually. But <laughs> I think they understand at the end of the day, like it comes from a good place and they know that I'm like, hey, look, I just need you to do this for me. And I promise you do this for me. I'll do this for you. So right. being transparent, that's, yeah. that's good. Well, I wanted to ask you, um, what supplements do you take? What's the magic tanner? Jester supplements that gets you to the eight figures. Come on, let's spill the yeah, beans, so, Tanner. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I'm not a huge fan of a lot of them, but I take uh, I take fish oil every day. I'll take turmeric, um, and then I'll take what else do I got over there? I'll take a probiotic, and I'll take some greens. I'll have like a green drink. But other than that, I don't take much. Mo most of the stuff isn't great, but that stuff, if you dose it high enough, you know, that's right. a big thing too. People with supplements, a lot of times it's very underdosed. So if it says take one, you usually need three or four. Uh, but if you take enough of that, it's that, that's what I've actually seen, like scientific evidence to back up is beneficial. Um, so I, I just I just stick to that. Basically, I don't really go too crazy. You heard it here, folks. If the supplement says something, take four times the amount. Just kidding. <laughs> no Tanner, Tanner, <laughs> Tanner, Tanner and just disclaimer, Tanner and Justin are not medical doctors. They do not recommend medical advice. Please consult your primary physician immediately if you ever consider taking four times the amount of anything. Yeah. Now that, now that we're not going to get sued. Okay. Um, <laughs> next, que next question. If Tanner had a billboard and you only had one message for the rest of eternity, what would uh, your billboard say? Jeez, dude. I know I'm hitting you with these fucking Thor hammers. Uh, you know, this is this is kind of a cop out probably, but you know, Nike, the Nike slogan, just do it. That that slogan speaks to me so on so many levels because even my dad growing up, you know, there's a lot of times where we feel uncomfortable, we feel uncertain. I mean, even talking about the new company I want to build, bro, of course I'm scared. Of course I, I'm like, man, I have no idea what the hell I'm going to do. Tanner gets scared. Yeah, right? right. But I see your ads. You're you got a you know you got all these things like yeah. You don't get scared. You're a robot. Yeah. No, I mean like I think everyone forgets that. So one of the bit, mm. one of the things my dad taught me and just like what that slogan kind of represents is even like it for me. It's like even when you feel scared, even when you feel uncomfortable, just do what you know you need to do to hit the goal. Just do it. Like you don't have to feel good all the time. You don't have to feel certain. You don't even have to feel confident. You just do it. And then a lot of times what happens is by taking those actions, that's what builds the confidence, right? Like a lot of people, they want to feel confident first and then take action. And it's like, no, you take the action and then the confidence comes and that then reinforces you taking yeah. more action. So right. that from a business standpoint, I would, I would say that. And then if, you know, if it was, yeah. if it was something about happiness and life, it'd probably be a different quote, but I, I just think right. most people just do it, man. Just stop thinking, yeah. just do it, just go, you know? And we'll, we'll take out the just. And then that's yours now. There you go. <laughs> what books have you gifted in the past five years to friends, family, employees, whoever, besides your own, that you think might be hidden gems? So I just read one recently. Um, I'm trying to remember the name. Um, let me see if I can pull it up. Uh, but while, while I'm thinking of that one, the one that I know for sure is um, Brendan Bouchard's High Performance Habits. I really like it because what as as you make more money, the money becomes less, less relevant, and then all of a sudden you're looking for more purpose. You're looking for like happiness, um, and I've even said that to people. Right now, for me in business, the money is more the scorecard. It's not I need more money per se. It's like if I keep making the same amount until I die, I mean I'll be have more than enough money. It's just more the scorecard. And then there's another book called um, Triggered. And it, it has some team building stuff in there and it talks, it, it kind of talks about how to set goals and how to reinforce them. Um, and so I really enjoy that book as well. Um, so awesome. ho hopefully that makes sense. Awesome. And then totally irrelevant. What's Tanner's favorite movie? Ooh. And what do you listen uh, to when you're, when you're driving around? Audiobooks. 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 Unfortunately, it's a boring answer. Uh, I, I like to, I like to listen and read as much as I can. But uh, my favorite movie, when it first came out, like the first time I saw it, because that's when the movie's the most exciting, yes. it was Inception. That was Ooh, such a cool Christopher movie. Christopher Nolan. Yeah, that's awesome. That was such a cool movie. And then probably right behind that was The Dark Knight. 
Uh, so you so you love Christopher Nolan because that's the same director. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like when when you watch it a few times, it's kind of like it's not as good. But when I first watched those two movies, like my heart yeah. at the movie was like racing. I was like, whoa! Like I was like a little kid. I love those movies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Interstellar, Memento. Christopher Nolan's my favorite yeah. director. So it's, yeah, it's, I didn't even know that. Movies. So yeah, he's he's on. Yeah, he made the, he made the Dark Knights and. Uh, he made Dunkirk, and he just made he made that new movie Tenet that everyone like nobody understood it. Oh yeah, you, I, I'm, I'm still confused. I'm still <laughs> confused. Like I, I watched that movie, and I said, you know what? I understood the deception after I watched it the second time. This movie, I'm completely confused. That movie was crazy. Like, but it was a crazy movie. It was a crazy. He movie. Tra- yeah, so he tried to make that movie for a really long time, and obviously, like, you know, because he made The Dark Knight, that's the only reason why he was able to have the funding for that movie because. Warner Brothers and big, you know, mainstream yeah, yeah. production companies. You no, know, because they know people aren't going to understand it. They want to simplify it so the average Joe, you know, like if that's why superheroes are great. Avengers, like, oh, I'll kill the bad guy, you know. And yeah, but those movies, Inception was fine. Tenant, yeah. I was lost, man. <laughs> there's people going forwards and backwards at the same time, and I'm like, what is happening? You heard, you heard it here, folks. That if you can yeah. understand Tenant, you can make nine figures a month yeah. in your business because Tanner doesn't ten. understand it. Nine or ten. <laughs> there's a lot of people like I understood that movie, probably not, <laughs> but they thought they did. Awesome, man. Cool. So, how do people reach out to you? Let's say they want to buy your course. Let's say they want to. Um, you know, they want you to coach them or your team to coach them. They want a done for you system. They want a done with you system. Yeah. Maybe they would just want to learn a bit, a little bit more about you. Maybe they just, they thought you were this guy and now listening to you, they realize that you're, a, you know, a really good guy and a normal guy. Well, uh, how do people reach out to you or not? Maybe they hate you. I don't know. Yeah, but- yeah. <laughs> uh, the easiest way is either Instagram to shoot me a DM or they can just go to my main website. So elitecos.com okay. and that's going to have testimonials, what we do a little bit more about me, like the whole nine. So one of those two places is always the best. Gotcha. Do you have like a newsletter or email list that people can get updates periodically from you? Yeah. They just got to opt in, just opt into one of my pages. Just opt in. Yeah, you I, don't, guys? I don't have like a link off the top of my head where it's just to subscribe to the newsletter. Yeah. But you see something of mine, just opt in and you'll start getting emails, I promise. Awesome. Awesome. Taken from the elite marketer himself. Cool, man. <laughs> Any last words before we end this thing? No, man. I just, I just, I really appreciate you having me. And I hope if anyone listens to this, uh, you know, don't be scared to take action. You know, beginner, you know, experts were always, were once beginners. Trust me, no one thought I was an expert a few years ago. So, uh, take action and things can change very quickly for you. Yeah, I think that's a good point to touch on at the end is, you know, typically you ask, like, if you could go back in time, you know, tenant style, what would you do? I think you just answered that. Yeah, I like, and and then the other thing is I'd hire people faster. And, and I know more, I know better than anyone. I've had probably more bad coaching experiences than anyone who's watching this. So, but what I will tell you is you'll get to your goal a lot faster. And when you truly learn how money works and how to make money, it, it's not going to really matter. It's, it's way right. easier to just learn how to make a lot more money than to try to like save your way to wealth. I just learn how to make more. And then all the investments and all the bad experiences are going to be highly irrelevant. But Tanner, I've invested in four people, four gurus, and I, and I still don't have a profitable business. I, I understand, man. Do it again. I get just it. Keep going. It's, just, it's just part of it, man. And it's like I, my, my first, I had five coaches before I started making money. And and so while, mm. while I understand, I always make the analogy of a girl, you know, like yes. if you date a girl and she breaks up with you. Do you start dating guys or do you go <laughs> ask another girl out? You know, now, if you're into guys, OK, but, you know, if, yeah. if, if you date girls and a girl breaks your heart, you don't just say, oh, I'm not going to date a girl. again. it's like, no, you date another girl. So I understand it hurts more with finances, but if you have to think of it for me. I just was like, well, I still don't know what to do fully. So I can either hire someone else or I can just sit here and pout. And so I just kept going. It was just the only. I think that's a good point, though, because now you're at an elite level. But you like to highlight what you said. So people don't like overlook it. You had five coaches before you started becoming the Tanner that people see now. Yeah. Most people hire one coach and they fail and they say, oh, this is bullshit. Yeah, and, and I, 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 it's not like every coach I hired was great. I mean, I could, yeah. I could sit here and complain about, well, they didn't do this and this was bad. But at the end of the day, they're all part of my success. I, I learned things from each of them. And while there were things I was like, I would wish I'll never do that and X, Y, and Z, 
It's yep. all part of your, it's all part of how you get to where you're at. There's no such thing as you just go straight to the top. Like you're going to hit stuff along the way and coaches will help you hit them faster. So you get there faster. And to me, like we only have 80 years to live. So don't you want to get to your goals as fast as possible so you can go to the next one? I, that's how I view it. <laughs> You heard it here. You heard it here first, folks. I think a lot of people are going to gain a lot of value from this, Tanner. I appreciate you coming on the show. If anyone's interested in reaching out to Tanner, uh, go to his social media sites, opt in. You will get hit with emails. I promise you. He is an elite marketer. And um, Tanner, it was great to have you on the show. You heard it here, folks, from Tanner to Jester's mouth to Justin Caviar's ears. This is the Justin Caviar Show, and we are out.